Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We have the panel here with us today, and uh, we'll get started. The first to present is Dr. Dr. Lamb will, will do us an intro here. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for today's noon conference, Dr. Lamb. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, the idea for giving this presentation came about um, when in mid-February we started teaching the medical students in their big cardiopulmonary um, renal block um, that they have for three months each spring. And as we were teaching, um, suddenly along came the COVID crisis, which occurred while the students were all on spring break. So the school had to hastily send out an email saying, don't come back, anybody. And then in one week, the whole tra uh, curriculum was transformed from a regular curriculum into a completely online curriculum, including the lectures, the small groups, and interactive sessions. And after we had been doing this for about two months with some growing pains, the, the um, majority of the teaching for cardiopulmonary renal is done by Metro faculty. So after we had been doing this for a couple of months, one of the education deans said to us, wouldn't it be a good idea if you guys could give a little optional noontime session that would just talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the systems that they've been studying so that they um, understand how the things that they are learning uh, actually have relevance in today's world. And we thought that was a pretty good idea, so we um, put together the session, um, four of us, which included at that time um, Dr. Vidya Krishnan and Bob Kalajan. Um, and we presented this thing, and it was uh, a lot of fun to put together. It was a lot of work. Um, and then afterwards we decided, well, maybe for all the work we put in, <clears throat> we should just uh, present this to the residents of our own hospital. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, and so we decided to do that. And I can tell you that um, trying to get four busy clinicians together to do this is like hurting cats, yeah. unfortunately. Um, and I'll warn you also that this could easily be four one-hour sessions with each of us talking about our specialty. But what we're intending to do today is just to give you a tiny little sample of the things that each of us has learned that has sparked our interest and that we have learned in um, dealing with this material and this disease. And uh, also to remind you that our personal learning curves, unlike the infection curves, we are not hoping for them to flatten or go down, but to continue to go up every day. And I can tell you that they have already gone up a lot between May 12th, which was the date of this original presentation, and today. So we'll start with Dr. Terabici, and then Dr. Hecker, and then me and Dr. Hija. Good, thanks. Okay. So, do they not hear anything? No, no, I think that's just uh, that's the uh, interface telling us that uh, we're good. We're going to keep going. <laughs> I'll have to repeat this. So, when is it now working? Oh, it was not working for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to roll back for a quick second and just say this is the number of COVID 19 uh, de uh, detections inpatient in, in the ED. That's the red data with the axis on the left compared to the county on the right. And the point is, we're catching a proportion of the patients, and you know, as we'd expect, in parallel with the pandemic. Uh, I don't know if this number surprises anybody. We were obviously relatively spared, so it's a blessing. I think we have all talked more about what we would do with the COVID-19 pandemic, much more than we've actually spent taking care of patients with COVID-19, which is a blessing. So we'll go with it. Um, here's some more information about kind of where patients ended up. And the, the purpose of this is just to show you the overall trend. Um, at least by units over time, 
you kind of get the sense where patients landed. A lot of them ended up in the CCP, not because they were necessarily uh, critically ill. Was that Dr. Krishna? What was that? She, she left a message here. I can see slides, but not the speaker. Sorry. Okay. Well, well, I think that's probably better than speaker, not slides. Um, <laughs> Where patients ended up, so primarily the CCP, because we elected to have a, a dedicated unit, the overall census never really, rarely peaked over 20, only more recently. And in terms of, you know, the number of patients on ventilators at any given point in time, that's the graph here on the right, you know, something along like somewhere between zero to, to seven or eight, probably more of an average of five. Uh, and as you know, with this pandemic, you know, patients check in and have a hard time checking out, especially those that end up on the ventilator like a morbid hotel, California. Um, so a lot of that momentum and census we had was not from new cases. So if you look at these, the black dots here in these graphs, that's actually the number of new cases that we admit or see in the ED per day. And, and that's been pretty steady, luckily. But the census was rising primarily because people were hanging around longer. Another piece of this data puzzle, uh, so that's where I talked about where they end up. Um, the overall number that we've evaluated in the ED in the hospital is somewhere over 300. There's some demographic data here that I'm not going to get into too much, and also some missing data with some NA values. I apologize for that. Um, long story short is obviously the people that end up on the ventilator, not a huge number, have been discharged, and discharge can be celestial or otherwise. And so of the people that were discharged, we've had 11 of, of the ventilated patient, patients, we've had 11 deaths, um, and the remainder actually uh, you know, obviously not, not deceased, so different outcome. And a smaller number that were not ventilated, presumably these were people that were comfort care. So when all is said and done, today we have not seen a lot of deaths due to COVID, admittedly. Again, and I think that's primarily because of the volume that we've experienced. And these ratios of ED to inpatient to, to ICU and ventilator mortality are pretty consistent with what we're hearing from places that were not, again, that were only moderately hit. Um, and now we're not completely overwhelmed. Okay, so it's distracting me with the text line. Uh, I'm, the point of this, I think, is to give perspective for where, where we started and kind of where, where we are now in terms of how we've reacted to the pandemic. So I think at the beginning, we were all worried, obviously freaking out, thinking this is a, a, an almost, you know, at least you would believe a universally fatal condition. Um, and I think we've been jolted and we've had some missteps as a community. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of talk about the concept of these intents of its perspective. It was very easy to be swayed by a ton of data that would come out, you know, every other week, many in the form of non-peer-reviewed preprints or press releases. Um, that made it sound like we suddenly had a miracle cure for this, that we were supposed to have been doing something entirely different. And so I think that those who have worked with me know that I'm a bit of a minimalist. I think less is more. Most of what I do in the ICU is try not to hurt people um, because I think a lot of our tools are, are not just double-edged swords, but, you know, I guess the, the, the hurting part of that sword is even bigger than the saving part. Um, so I'm going to say that the principles that have guided me through this mess of data and new information on a daily basis is remember what we know. So sound evidence-based medicine, and remember the priors for you Bayesianists out there, that's an understanding of the likelihood of an impact of a therapy on, on a condition. And so we've been studying and managing ARDS and viral pneumonia for decades, and we've learned a lot. It's kind of improbable that some of these treatments that we've tried in this condition are suddenly going to work for COVID-19. Um, and more importantly, we actually know a lot of what Dublin was. And so on that same token, kind of don't be moved by sensational findings. And that includes all that bad science, retracted studies, and disappointing preprints that we keep seeing. And I'll remind you of a couple of these, where, where you know, there were media grabbing headlines, which were unbelievable. The JAMA article from, from the New York cohort that showed an 80% mortality, right, when more than half of the patients were still in the hospital, which led to widespread alarm and articles about whether or not we should even be intubating these people, right? Um, that article on, or that preprint, it wasn't even an article, it was a preprint. Somebody put this in the Met Archive. Anybody who touched Pepsid during admission for COVID had a 30, almost a 30% decreased risk of death, which 
didn't really carry an impressive probabilistic mechanism of action and had an effect size that just didn't make sense. You didn't even account for exposure. You just have to lick a tablet of Pepsi and your life was saved. This was, this was another favorite. Smoking is protective. Like, I don't even want to start with that. There's no rhyme or reason for that to be true. Um, now, so now people, people will generate some, some you know, they'll, they'll put together some flow charts of, of cellular mechanisms and justify it, fair enough, but, um, and I, I don't know if you guys know that this camp from fossil with COVID and otherwise. Therefore, that means smoking is protected. Again, preprint, not peer-reviewed, complete media blowout. Um, I've, I've had a few interviews with Cleveland.com about these. You know, kind of everybody calm down, take a deep breath, and stop recording about pre breath. And then let's not forget the most recent egregious example, Surgisphere, which is a company that didn't exist a year ago, suddenly exists and has 640 EHR uh, systems in its database and data on patients in countries that don't even have EHRs uh, that basically knock Plaquenil. ill. NEJM Lancet articles, retractions, and, and basically disappointment. This actually led to, to the whole thing. Now, I'm not a believer in Plaquenil, no, but it, le it led studies to stop in their, in their tracks. You know, people said, why should we study this if it's that bad? And so we have made a lot of just mistakes, and I think a lot of sensationalism has driven, and I think it's, it's not that it's unfounded. I think it's just that we're trying to do, do well by our patients. And so I'm just going to quickly go through an example of ARGS, because I think that's the most specific thing that I can talk about that, that kind of paints what I'm trying to describe here. But this can be, this can be extended to anything. Like, the issues of whether or not we should be prophylactically anticoagulating these folks or whether or not we should be putting them on steroids, which show me the data and then we'll talk. So some of the early data out of Europe, in particular in Italy, showed that some of these patients seem to have a higher lung compliance than expected. So ARDS, we typically think of a stiff lung condition. And so some of the researchers who are named in this slide but shall not be named <laughs> in this talk um, actually jumped from that conclusion to say, I have a cohort of 16 people with highly compliant ARGS. That's weird. That's not supposed to be ARGS. There is a hypothetical notion of, of basically a patient-induced lung injury, right, uh, or a self-induced lung injury where patients are hyperventilating because they can't breathe or they're hypoxic. That's the P-silly concept. And that that could conceptually lead to more lung injury. And so they recommended without any evidence based on their observational information, early intubation, effective sedation, paralysis that will quote unquote interrupt the cycle. So, you know, I'm gonna stop there and, and, and point back to the issue of everything that we do in ARDS, ventilators included, essentially might cause more ARDS. Giving people oxygen, intubating them, knocking them out, leaving them on the ventilator uh, longer is potentially harmful. So of course, like, in the modern era, all good medical information is now coming from the Twitterverse, and I made the terrible decision of getting on Twitter exactly as COVID-19 rolled around thinking, this is going to be great. I'm going to learn a lot of good things. So the group that proposed this tweeted about the article, backlash, you know, large little steps ahead, says Gattinoni, and then some of the uh, slightly more aggressive University of Michigan folks are outward saying, you mean large step backwards, or this is highly speculative, or we've always had compliant ARDS. What are you talking about? Um, a lot of things were said. Some people left Twitter. It was, it was an interesting time. Of course, you know, to make things more interesting than uh, Martin Tobin, who, like, basically wrote the book on mechanical ventilation, uh, pens an article about this, and I think it's worth reading. And this is going to be my last slide before I pass it on, or one of my last slides. But this notion of, you know, P-silly being basically literally silly and not well validated and all of a sudden juxtaposing a limited anecdotal exposure to this pathologic correlate, deciding that we should flip everything we know on its head. Uh, and the quote that I'm going to list is actually the second one, which is great, which is the process of transforming thoughts about a new biological entity into material things takes years. Once the existence of a new entity is corroborated through additional research, it acquires substance and is gradually accepted as approximating truth. History is replete with entities once viewed as real, not considered fiction. I don't even know what those are. And at this time, the existence of PCLE is based only on the shakiest of circumstantial evidence and has yet to be exposed to the acid wash of experimental testing by different scientists. And that is exactly the paradox, which is everything that we use for the treatment of ARGS is not actually a treatment. It's minimizing harm. And so when you have somebody with COVID-19 associated you know, pneumonia, the last thing you want to do is intubate them early and 
you know, sedate them and paralyze them for longer and keep her on the ventilator longer, right? We know the things that work are things that are essentially protective, like protective lung ventilation, which is useful not just in ARDS, data's actually been extended to non-ARDS conditions, uh, condition, like just people with elective uh, surgery. Uh, proning, not fluid overloading people, maybe providing paralytics, and if so, for a short period of time. Uh, early, you know, early extubation, SVTs, um, minimizing benzos, right? Like things that we know in critical care, you know, really well and work well, it just did not make sense to flip that all on its head because of just some, you know, some kind of free association of what somebody was currently seeing, essentially. And so I think that this is kind of my parallel for everything that we've been experiencing. And so I would say, you know, the, going back to the concept of the hashtags intensivist is do what you know works and be really, really nervous or cautious about applying new things that, that don't seem to have a lot of evidence behind them or that seem extremely sensational um, and, and unbelievable. And before you think that I'm a complete science nihilist, like I think that we do need to study this, we need to understand more. Um, and we are, some of you may know, contributing to uh, the Society of Critical Care Medicine's database of all admitted patients with COVID-19, we are, I think, uh, you know, I think kind of in a good position here. So this is the sites that are contributing in terms of the volume. Um, and we're kind of smack in the middle, even though we have a relatively small number of, of COVID-19 patients. And we're like right behind, you know, Cleveland Clinic and, and Mayo Clinic. So I feel like it's good company. Um, hopefully we'll keep it up. But this is a large database that we are accumulating data for which also means, by the way, that we have data here internally for analysis. And I think we're using that for a couple of prospective research studies and otherwise. So I just want to put that plug in there and say, like, the way to solve this problem is to have high quality studies and not be overreactionary. And with that, I'm going to pass it on. I think so. Yeah. A lot of discussion. Okay, so I have 10 minutes or less to talk about the challenge of COVID management from the perspective of an infectious disease physician and an antimicrobial steward. Um, so I think Yasser, Dr. Terabici mentioned a number of these things. You know, the difficulties in figuring out what to offer in terms of treatment is uh, difficult when you're in the middle of a pandemic that's rapidly evolving. People are dying. It's a new virus. You know, there's all this stress about what to do. And then I'll call it the overwhelming PPE of COVID, and I don't mean personal protective equipment, but I mean preprints, press, and evidence <laughs> in quotation marks, which again, uh, Dr. Terabici addressed. Um, unfortunately, these aren't my uh, the latest slides, but that's okay. Um, there was, um, there's also this, this um, tendency to say in vitro activity will lead to clinical effectiveness or safety. And I had a picture of bleach in my updated slides, but clearly we know that that's not um, necessarily the case. So you can't jump from in vitro activity to an agent being clinically effective. Uh, then there's the, you know, first you're hot and then you're not phenomenon, which again is the hydroxychloroquine, uh, hydroxychloroquine azithro issue. And now we're flipping that the other way for the corticosteroids, that first you're not hot, you know, with corticosteroids and now you are. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, and then, in terms of, um, you know, how, how do you navigate this, though? Because you have to provide some guidance on what treatment you might want to pursue in terms of investigational studies or even off-label use of certain agents. So I've tried to factor in the following things in my decision-making, and that would be biologic plausibility. You know, what is the existent data from, like, case series, cohorts, realizing they're very limited, but they might provide some information about safety or other things. Um, ultimately looking for you know, randomized clinical trials, but realize you have to critically look at those randomized clinical trials as well because who is the population that's being enrolled? What are the treatments and are they getting other concomitant treatments as, as well? When in the time course of illness are they getting their therapies and what is the primary outcome? Um, we also look at data from other viruses that are similar, so other coronaviruses, other outbreaks of SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, to help us figure out what might be useful to try. Um, fortunately, with COVID, um, many institutions have kind of shared their experiences and their guidelines and recommendations online. So University of Washington and New York State, they were early on in the epidemic before we even had a lot of cases. So it was useful to get um, insight from them. 
Um, and we're always weighing the risks and benefits, you know, with any treatment. It doesn't even matter if it's investigational or, or having to do with COVID, but the risks and benefits of, of any therapy. Um, so in terms of caring for the real patients, so we're, when you're on service, um, COVID ICU or other things, and we're consulting from an ID perspective, um, I think it's most useful to have a, a team-based approach, which we have done. Uh, key infectious diseases, rheumatology, immunology, and Dr. Singer has been very helpful for you know, sorting out patients who may or may not have uh, cytokine release syndrome. And clearly the patients, um, because these, none of these treatments are FDA approved and we need to discuss the risks and benefits and certainly get their input on the willingness to try some of these investigational therapies. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's important to navigate all these expectations and it's on both sides. Some people think all these treatments are wonderful and think it's the magic bullet and other people think they're completely useless and, and we shouldn't be doing any of these things. So, you know, the, you have to have some, uh, you know, kind of uh, thinking about both sides of these things. Um, and realize that the benefits may not be immediate. So for some of these investigational agents, um, you might not see somebody get better after one day of treatment. You know, sometimes there are delayed uh, results. So when I'm thinking about whether I want to talk to a patient or talk to the team about, you know, should we try one of these investiga investigational agents, the factors that I'm taking into consideration are the time course of their illness, when was their symptom onset, what are their current signs, symptoms, lab results, what is the result of their SARS-CoV test result. Now, this is not an EPIC. This is an ID kind of thing. You know, we look at the cycle threshold, which is kind of a surrogate for the viral load, and I'm able to access that information from the lab. And it, it's not perfect. It's not the be-all, end-all, but it gives me a better sense of what's going on with the patient. Um, what are the availabilities of the investigational agents? What's the current data on their use? What are the contra contraindications? What is the patient's risk for deterioration? So many of these people get better without anything, and do we really want to subject them to an investigational agent if they're going to get better anyway? And then clearly uh, patient preference is important. Um, so this is just a schematic uh, kind of an overview of the clinical course of severe COVID-19 infection. The red line is the SARS-CoV-2 RNA levels. Um, the X uh, access is the time since the COVID-19 symptom onset, and the boxes above kind of give you the clinical symptoms or um, syndromes associated with COVID-19. This is absolutely not set in stone, so these are not like, oh, at day 8 you have this symptom, then the day 8 to 14 you have these symptoms. Absolutely not. It's just kind of a general kind of sense of how this sometimes evolves in many patients. Um, and then underneath are some of the therapeutic interventions, investigational inter, inter, uh, interventions that we have that I'm going to discuss briefly. Um, and it appears most people believe maybe that the antivirals and convalescent plasma may have their greatest benefit early on in the course of infection, um, but there's a long tail, as you see, you know, that it could be effective even further out. Um, and for the immune uh, modulators, and I'm speaking mainly about tocilizumab right now, it's probably greatest effectiveness is kind of around this cytokine storm, which is that storm cloud I have up there. You know, that's where it seems like the best role for that agent is. But other immunomodulators, again, there's a long tail on both sides, you know, when or this may or may not be effective. Um, so for the next five minutes, I'm just going to go over the investigational agents that we have used at Metro Health um, and, and discuss some of the evidence that we currently have related to their use. So remdesivir um, is an antiviral that inhibits RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's active in other coronaviruses as well. Currently, we have this available through the emergency use authorization. Um, this is from the FDA allowing providers to use this drug, even though it's not yet FDA approved. Uh, earlier on, we were part of, uh, we were one of the sites participating in the um, uh, expanded access protocol where we could only give it to patients who are mechanically ventilated, <clears throat> but now that restriction is gone. Um, the contraindications to remdesivir are creatinine clearance of less than 30 or transaminases that are greater than five times the upper limit of normal. We have treated uh, four patients through the expanded access uh, protocol and 12 patients through the emergency use authorization. 
Um, in terms of the data about um, what evidence there is, I'm just presenting to you the two randomized controlled trials that were published. Um, so the first, and these are both randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded studies, um, both looking at time to clinical improvement within 28 days. Um, so if I start with a study from China, um, this was a little bit of a letdown when it was first uh, released, the results of this study, in terms of that there didn't appear to be any statistically significant difference in outcomes between patients on remdesivir versus placebo. Um, there seemed to be maybe a signal, however, um, in patients who were treated within 10 days of symptom onset, if I have a pointer here, yeah, um, that, um, you know, within uh, 10 days of symptom onset, there was a shorter time to clinical improvement, 18 days versus 23 days. Again, this didn't reach statistical significance, but it might be a signal. And in, in terms of the 28-day mortality, it was 11% versus 15%. Um, so again, a possible signal. Um, what I will say, there are some limitations to this study in that they did not fully enroll. Um, they did not meet their sample size, upfront sample size target. In fact, it was probably less than half, and their, their power to really detect the difference was reduced to like 58% or something. Um, secondly, there were, were some baseline differences between the remdesivir and placebo group. Um, not sure if they were statistically significant, but the remdesivir group did seem a little bit worse uh, off in terms of their baseline characteristics. Um, and um, oh, there's one other thing with the study. Oh, the other issue was the population that was enrolled. So, it, most of these patients were patients only on nasal cannula. There was a very small percentage of each patients that were on mechanical ventilation or requiring high-flow nasal cannula, about 15% requiring high-flow nasal cannula, less than 1% on mechanical ventilation. So just keep that in mind when you're, you know, interpreting the results of these studies. They maybe were not that sick. You might not see a difference. You know, they're, they're, all of these people are going to get better anyway, you know. So you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. The other thing I wanted to point out with the adverse events was that you'll note that the serious adverse events were higher in the placebo group compared to the remdesivir group, which was also seen in the NIH study that I'm going to present. And that's because these people are sick. You know, they're, they're always, you know, things are happening to these people, and it's not always related to the treatment that we're giving. Um, so just bear that in mind. So the second study was just um, published end of May in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the NIH study that was a multi-center study, a number of countries across the world. Most of the sites were in the United States. Again, the primary outcome was time to clinical improvement within 28 days. And here there was a statistically significant difference with improvement with remdesivir compared to placebo. Um, their, their patients didn't all meet the 28-day endpoint yet, so they just uh, reported on the 14-day mortality. And uh, again, there was numerically um, uh, lower rates of mortality in the remdesivir arm compared to the placebo arm. Again, this was not statistically significant, but possibly a signal there. Um, more data to come. We'll see. So the second treatment we've been um, offering to patients is convalescent plasma. And this is um, uh, infusing plasma from patients who have donated their plasma. These are patients that have had COVID-19 infection, recovered from it, and donated to the Red Cross or whatever blood bank. And it's infusing this into patients with COVID-19 infection. And the theory, the mechanism behind this is it's both antiviral and immunomodulatory effects. So by neutralizing antibody within the plasma, they have a direct antiviral effect. And then there are other things in plasma besides just neutralizing antibody, which also may provide some immunomodulatory effects to, you know, clear virus and clear infected cells uh, from the system. So this is available through the Mayo Clinic expanded access protocol is how we are accessing this. Um, there really are no significant contraindications. We have treated about 14 patients with convalescent plasma. There was a randomized controlled trial that was just published in JAMA uh, maybe 14 days ago, two weeks ago. Um, this study also did not fully enroll. They, they only enrolled half of the patients they were um, trying to enroll, so bear that in mind. Uh, their main outcome was uh, clinical improvement within 28 days. Um, this um, did not reach statistical significance, but a uh, higher percentage of patients in the convalescent plasma arm did have clinical improvement within 20 days compared to the standard arm. 
And notably for patients with severe disease, this did reach statistical significance. Again, this is kind of a subgroup analysis, but more patients receiving convalescent plasma compared to standard therapy uh, had improvement at 28 days. Um, and the mortality differences were not significant, but again, lower mortality with convalescent plasma compared to standard. And interestingly, um, more patients uh, converted to a negative PCR test at these different time points, 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours. More patients did that in the convalescent plasma arm compared to the standard therapy arm, and that was statistically significant. The figures below, I'm just showing just specifically for this in the middle to show that um, for the group with severe disease, there did seem to be, again, some difference between the, the arms. And the difference was seven days or more after randomization, getting to the point that the, the, the benefits of these investigational agents may not be immediate. It might be something that you see down the road. Um, tocilizumab, um, so on the left is uh, kind of the typical, um, so IL-6, you know, and when it, which is produced in response to different um, stimuli or infections and things, is green. The IL-6 receptors are blue, and there are soluble IL-6 receptors, and there are membrane-bound uh, IL-6 receptors. Typically, IL-6 binds to its receptor, kind of interacts with the GP-130, and then causes a signal transduction and inflammatory storm, if you will, or response. So tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody, orange here, that binds to the IL-6 receptors, so preventing IL-6 from binding and then presenting this whole cascade of events. Um, so this uh, drug is FDA approved for other indications, including cytokine release syndrome related to CAR-T uh, therapy. Um, so there's some plausibility with this because we think there is some sort of cytokine storm in some patients with COVID-19 infection. Um, the contraindications are elevated transaminases, low white count, platelets, and certainly having an active infection other than COVID-19 infection is a contraindication. We have treated 11 patients with tocilizumab and two with anakinra. Um, I am not aware of any published um, RCT results related to this. They are ongoing, but I, at least I haven't seen any recently come out, but certainly there are a number of case series reporting benefits. Um, so finally, just wanted to kind of touch upon the stewardship aspects of this, and Dr. Terabici mentioned this, don't forget the basics of very of good clinical care and how important that is. Number two, on presentation, coexistent bacterial infection seems rare, but the data is still out there. You know, we're still waiting. Deterioration certainly happens for these patients during hospitalization, and I came up with this mnemonic. It's not perfect, and it's certainly not in any order of frequency or importance, but consider medications, consider ARDS thrombosis, cytokine storm, healthcare-associated infection, anytime someone is deteriorating. Get appropriate lab testing up front if you're putting people on empiric antibiotic therapy, meaning appropriate cultures and other tests. Base your therapy on the syndrome that the patient has. Not everybody needs Vanco and Piptazo. You know, if you're treating for CAP, it's one thing. If it's HAP or VAP, it's another thing. So, you know, keep that in mind and de-escalate uh, based on culture results and clinical course. All right, that was my whirlwind presentation. <laughs> okay. okay, to start with, I'll just say that when you have COVID-19 and renal failure, it's bad news. And this is a study that came out of Wuhan um, and was published with looking at 700 patients that were admitted to the hospital, and bear in mind that this is a tertiary teaching hospital, very sick patients, and they looked at patients who had normal baseline serum creatinines on admission versus those who had elevated um, baseline serum creatinines, and they found that the ones that were more likely to have elevated creatinines, not surprisingly, were those who were older, um, who they were more likely to be male, they were more likely to have any comorbidity at all, at least one comorbidity, 60% versus 40, um, to have chronic kidney disease to start with, to have hypertension as baseline, to require mechanical ventilation, and to develop acute kidney injury uh, during their time in the hospital. And most alarmingly, that out of these patients, remember this is a very sick population whose in-hospital mortality, starting with the normal creatinine, was 
patients who had any sort of renal injury, either uh, coming in with elevated baseline creatinine or developing AKI in the hospital, had a mortality that was almost three times that high. Um, when we first heard about um, COVID-19 and the acute kidney injury that went with it, we all said, oh, yeah, well, of course, it's going to be sepsis-associated ATM. But as we went along, we found that there were other mechanisms by which the kidney could be injured, too. Other hemodynamic effects, for instance, of the cytokine storms that would occur with these patients. There could be direct cellular injury due to virus. Um, the viral entry into the cells could occur by interaction with an enzyme called ACE2, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then, of course, all the usual indirect mechanisms of injury, such as rhabdomyolysis and nephrotoxicity from medications. Um, now, this is an interesting study that um, I was amazed that they were able to do. They did this in Wuhan in the midst of all the terror and bad things that were happening. They took the time to carefully study 26 patients at autopsy, all of whom died because of respiratory failure. This was all um, pathologists at Wuhan except for Agnes Fogo, who is um, a, a premier a pathologist in this country, works at Vanderbilt. Um, and they put together this lovely study with just beautiful photography that I think was very enlightening. And they kind of went at it in the way detectives would go to look at all the possible manifestations um, of this disease on the kidney and then to relate them to the things that we see actually happen clinically. So 26 patients, all with respiratory failure, 19 uh, male, some female, average age 69, and only 9 out of 26 showed clinical signs of kidney injury, but all 26 had signs on autopsy. And a couple of the things that I'll just point out are, first of all, they had the expected acute tubular necrosis. And you could see evacuated cells without nuclei as the cells were dying um, from the, from the uh, disease. You also saw some pigmented casts um, along the way, um, which corresponded to um, uh, rhabdomyolysis, which, which was occurring in these patients. And you also saw here with these little arrowheads some aggregations of red blood cells that are not usual in a kidney biopsy, and these were thought to probably correlate with the coagulopathy or the um, um, uh, hypercoagulable state that is seen in some of these patients. Um, other things that were seen were some of these patients, many of them had, um, sorry, uh, bacterial infection. Um, and so, for instance, they could have bacterial pyelonephritis and have all the signs that you would expect with that. Um, then again, here are some of the pigmented casts that you see with rhabdomyolysis. Here are some hemosiderin casts that you see with bleeding into the tubules from the glomeruli. And here you can see glomeruli that have part of Bowman's space um, filled with this proteinaceous material, which corresponds to the proteinuria that is seen in some of these patients, which is not expected with acute tubular necrosis and therefore indicates presumably some glomerular injury. And then, um, interestingly, they were actually able to identify viral particles by electron microscopy. And just to give you a little perspective here, I hope you can see this, it says 65 and 67.9 nanometers. So a nanometer, just so you get your bearings here, would be one millionth of a millimeter. And so here we have little viral particles that are 67 to 60, 65 to 68 nanometers in diameter, indicated by the red, and the green indicates the little um, spikes on the outside of the viral particles. So these would be viral particles, or what you're seeing here with the, the red arrows, and then the um, uh, protein sp the, the spikes um, and the capsule that you can see here in the green arrows. And you can see them in various types of cells that are located in the kidney. Um, this identifies using immunofluorescent antibody um, the SARS-CoV nucleoproteins located mainly within the cytoplasm of tubular cells. And this um, slide shows you this antibody, antib by antibody, by immunohistochemistry, locations of ACE2, this enzyme ACE2 which in normal cells, these would be the non-COVID patients on the top two panels, can be found largely in proximal tubular cells. But in the COVID patients, can be seen in proximal tubular cells in a much greater amount and can also be found um, around the glomeruli in the parietal epithelial cells. And so thinking a little bit about this, what is ACE2? We don't hear very much about it because it's not important under normal circumstances. You have your normal pathway angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 converted by ACE. And then you have this little enzyme called ACE2 that was only recently discovered that kind of hangs out and does nothing under normal circumstances. But if the RAS pathway becomes overactive and there's a lot of angiotensin being produced, this stimulates, seems to, to um, bring into action the um, 
production of ACE2 and the activity of it. And what it does is it cleaves a couple of amino acids off of both angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 and essentially downregulates this entire pathway. So it modulates or dampens the activity of the usual ACE pathway and keeps it from getting completely out of hand. And what's interesting about ACE2 is that it has receptors that are contained on many cells, including the cardiovascular, the pulmonary, and the renal cells, which allow uh, the spikes from the SARS-CoV-2 proteins um, to uh, attach and to enter into the cells. And once it gets into the cells by using this ACE2 receptor, it can then replicate and cause all kinds of damage, and it also downregulates the surface activity of ACE2. So this now becomes important because at least in some um, animal studies and some cellular studies and studies on um, diseases other than COVID-19, in other words, um, SARS-CoV-1 virus uh, infection, some of the influenza viruses, it's been shown that when you have this dysregulation of ACE2, um, less ACE2 and uninhibited activity of angiotensin, that you can actually in increase the amount of acute lung injury and adverse effects on myocardial remodeling that occur with these diseases. And so this um, brought up a lot of questions. When people thought about this, they thought, well, are we doing our patients a disservice by keeping them on ACE inhibitors and ARBs? Should we be stopping these either prophylactically or if our patients actually um, come down with COVID-2? Um, and COVID-19, and so um, this sort of raised enough questions that a little task force got put together, which consisted of people from Harvard and the University of Minnesota and the University of Glasgow, and they decided to study what was known about this problem with ACE2 um, as much as was available, which wasn't all that much because this was relatively early on. And this was a little um, position paper that they uh, published in the New England Journal in April 23rd, which is now going on two months ago. A lot has happened since then. And um, so what they, what their primary findings from this study were, first of all, they, they pointed out there are a lot of unanswered questions, such as, do ACE inhibitors actually affect ACE2 levels or activity? That wasn't even known. And in looking in the papers, most of the time they found that studies did not show that ACE2 levels were increased, but there were a couple of studies that suggested that they were. Um, another question was, do ACE inhibitors actually increase angiotensin 1 production? Again, most of the time not, but some suggestion that they might be in some circumstances. And then they pointed out all these other things that we just simply didn't know. Are there differences in the different types of ACE inhibitors, in ACE inhibitors versus ARBs, the different locations of ACE2, uh, lung versus kidney, for instance, in animals versus human, or if you look at plasma levels versus t tissue levels. And then the big question, of course, is, if ACE2 levels and or activity do increase with the use of ACE inhibitors, does this actually translate to increased entry of CoV-2 into cells? And finally, what is the role of recombinant ACE2 in protecting or reversing tissue injury from CoV-2 if we've shown that that could happen? And so this group um, really summarized their findings very nicely by pointing out that even though uh, some preclinical studies have suggested that RAS inhibitors may increase ACE2 in expression, insufficient data are not avail are, are available to uh, figure out whether this actually applies to humans. Um, clinical trials are underway to look at things like recombinant human ACE2 and what their um, effects are. But the two things that the paper pointed out that we do know are that abrupt withdrawal of RAS inhibitors in high-risk patients, like people who have um, uh, heart failure that need an ACE inhibitor or who have just had a myocardial infarction, that can very, be very dangerous and lead to bad outcomes, and that until further data are available, we think that RAS inhibitors should be con continued in patients who are otherwise stable, even if they're at risk for, being evaluated for, or actually have COVID-19. And I think their final statement is just a beautiful, elegant, um, rational um, statement of, of all the things that, that are good about an academic group like this. And they say, although additional data may further inform the treatment of high-risk patients with COVID-19, Clinicians need to be cognizant of the unintended consequences of prematurely discontinuing proven therapies in response to hypothetical concerns that may be based on incomplete experimental evidence. And I feel that this statement is just a wonderful uh, summary of, of the way that academicians should be thinking and acting um, in the face of um, various treatments that are being proposed to us, such as drinking bleach and um, trying to uh, fry our insides with ultraviolet light and so on. And, um, you know, is a good answer to things that come up like this uh, group that is the same group, um, essentially, as, as the one that um, Yasser mentioned that with the um, 
uh, Plaquenil study, this group also looked at um, using the same faulty database surgisphere and looked at the effect of uh, ACE inhibitors on these patients and generated something that I've never seen, an expression of concern in the New England Journal, which went right on their editorial page. After they had pre-printed this paper, they say, recently, substances concerns have been raised about the quality of information in that database, this surgisphere database. We have asked the authors to provide evidence that the data are reliable. And even before this expression of concern was printed in this week's New England Journal, um, that paper had been retracted. So just keep in mind, again, just to not jump on every bandwagon of things that come about and, and just uh, keep thinking and looking critically at what we know. the pathophysiology of cardiovascular complications of COVID-19, discuss the complications of COVID-19 from currently existing cardiovascular conditions, and explain the system-wide standard of care modification in the era of COVID-19. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So it, it's been evident from uh, multiple studies that there are prognostic risk factors for uh, poor outcomes uh, in patients. Um, for the development of death and uh, respiratory distress. Um, the most important ones, as you've heard from other presenters before me, age, obesity, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, somebody, I'm sorry, was I muted? Okay. Okay. I hope everyone can hear me. Apologize for that. So, uh, for the, in terms of cardiovascular disease, uh, the presence of coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure and diabetes, which I do consider a cardiovascular disease, um, is associated with the um, poor outcomes of patients that present with COVID-19. So uh, the, the various laboratory and clinical manifestations that are determinant of prognosis are adult respiratory distress syndrome, as Dr. Tarabici talked about, uh, the presence of myocardial injury, which is um, most sensitively detected by an elevated troponin, whether it is from myocarditis, uh, stress cardiomyopathy, right ventricular stress, or failure, 
trivial matter. Uh, then there could be pre-existing uh, asymptomatic cardiovascular, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which can make type 2 injury worse. And you can have your typical ST elevation myocardial infarction because in a patient with inflammation, plaques, uh, which are already present, can actually get really inflamed. And we've shown this to be the case with uh, in pandemics of influenza that are particularly bad, that you see a wave of uh, myocardial infarctions uh, because of plaque rupture, because the plaque tends to get inflamed and become unstable. And you can see a significant number of patients presenting with, cardio with uh, acute myocardial infarction. The paradox with this pandemic uh, was that the number of patients presenting with an acute myocardial infarction actually dropped. And it seems that uh, this drop occurred because uh, patients are afraid of coming to the hospital and actually having infarction at home. Uh, the other um, aspect of it that was covered by other speakers was the, uh, the, the development of a disseminated intravascular coagulation and the formation of microthrombi, which leads to microvascular dysfunction, that there's vasculitis, and uh, there's stress cardiomyopathy, so you can see patients manifesting with your typical or atypical Takotsubo syndrome. And the hyperinflammatory syndrome, which has been shown to be significantly associated with uh, cardiac arrhythmias and indeed worsening uh, myocardial inflammation and function. So there's tons of different ways in by which uh, the heart can be affected. Of course, the um, patho pathophysiology that was just described affects all of the organs as well. So it's a systemic disease. Okay, so uh, the challenges to the care of the acutely ill patients um, are related to the high transmission risks of the cardiovascular care team. So in ST elevation MI patients, which requires the uh, escalation of a whole team of individuals, including physicians, uh, nurses, radiology, technologists, need to be protected. So the guideline at this time states that if you're a PCI-capable hospital, the patient with a clear-cut ST elevation MI should be screened in the emergency room for real versus not a real ST elevation MI, they should be taken to the cath lab. Um, there was some talk about taking these patients potentially a thrombolysis, but of course, that is not the recommendation. I think a lot of the fear was related to the cath labs getting overwhelmed uh, in uh, places in northern Italy where there were just too many patients presenting. Uh, but, you know, as the, the current guideline states that you do not need to thrombolyze these people, you just have to take the right set of precautions. Uh, sonographers performing a cardiogram, the American Society of ECHO has issued a statement that if the ECHO is uh, not likely to change uh, the outcome, then we should perhaps just do either a very limited ECHO, uh, which is focused on MV and RV function, uh, and you know, minimize exposure of the sonographer or the fellow on call uh, to, and, uh, to performing an echocardiogram. And then uh, one of the highest risk procedures in uh, this age is the transesophageal echo because it's, a, it's there's significant production of aerosols by patients because they're coughing uh, and they're sort of vocalizing and you cannot really put a mask uh, on the patient's face when you're doing a TE because the probe is right there. So um, it's uh, so for the TE procedure uh, the risk is extremely high and that's why as, as an institution we are testing everyone uh, for uh, COVID-19 of an uh, inpatient or an outpatient DE procedure. The other issue is, uh, you know, there could be delays in performing these procedures like the percutaneous coronary intervention in time because we have society benchmarks that actually want us to perform, say, PCI within 90 minutes of the patient arriving to the hospital. And um, those benchmarks may be more difficult to be met at this time, and I think these, uh, at this time these societies have been very generous in that they're allowing for a clause uh, for mentioning that the delay was potentially because of all the logistical uh, issues that are related to the patient's uh, concurrent illness. The other thing I forgot to mention was that if the patient is in respiratory distress and in the emergency room and is presenting with an ST elevation by cardiac infarction, they uh, ought to be intubated as, uh, before they go to the cath lab, and that certainly adds quite a bit to the uh, door to the balloon time. And in those situations, of course, and you know, a special condition has to be made uh, for those delays. So, um, you know, the, some of the cardiovascular manifestations are a false positive ST elevation, which is seen in patients who present almost with the same um, sort of syndrome 
uh, that would that mimics um, an SP elevation by cardinal attraction. I don't know how well the ECG projects here, but uh, there is a fair cut SP elevation in lead one and ABL. And there's some SP elevation in the lateral leads here as well, which is V5 to V4 to V6. Uh, we don't see a lot of reciprocal ST depression, which is one of the clues about the, as to, um, you know, regarding the presence of a real ST elevation MI versus uh, could potentially myocarditis. And uh, as you can see, the angiogram in this patient uh, does not show any significant manifestations. And the echocardiogram can be uh, used as a screening tool, a certainly point of care ultrasound uh, in the emergency room is a very powerful tool to actually uh, make, to use as the point of decision making um, whether or not the patient needs to go to the cath lab. So if, if your patient's uh, uh, cardiac function is completely normal uh, or is, uh, you know, marginally abnormal on, in the right ventricle side, then it's certainly unlikely to be an ST elevation MI that needs to be taken to the cath lab. So those are some of the things that you can use to effectively screen these patients. Um, so uh, the innovations that we made uh, as a society uh, in cardiology, I'm speaking globally all over the world, is the use of point of care ultrasound in face of a detailed echo. And uh, Metro Health uh, took a big initiative in this regard. We bought the 20 devices um, that were distributed to all various units that were potentially going to take care of patients with uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, there was a real push by the administration in, the, in a very positive direction to actually perform, make this technology available to people that wanted to get quick information without relying upon a formal echocardiogram. And this is a good opportunity for us to actually move this forward um, and, you know, get us all educated and so on and so forth, and there are plans to do that. And again, use of thrombolysis, not commonplace, wouldn't be recommended, but it can be done in select instances. Uh, and patients that present with uh, non-ST elevation MI that are deemed to be somewhat low risk, um, not particularly high risk non-STEMI, uh, you could go towards medical management. Of course, the high-risk non-STEMI patients should still go to the cath lab because the urgency is simply not there. And you can do proper screening and use a, a personal protective equipment. Um, use of cardiac CT and MRI is, uh, is certainly, um, you know, um, been, has been widespread um, to diagnose through myocardial infarction versus myocarditis. And cardiac CT is especially useful in doing quadruple rule-out. Uh, you can look for the, uh, the pulmonary manifestations. You can rule out acute coronary syndrome. You can diagnose pulmonary emboli and actually even diagnose myocarditis with CT. What we were, we were actually using CT in place of transesophageal echo when COVID was really at its peak, rule out left atrial appendage thrombus, and we ended up using this protocol in several patients and uh, with good effects. And this is based upon data from the University of Virginia. Uh, the other um, adaptation um, that was uh, the, the measurement of QT interval by telemetry instead of doing routine 12 dd ECG. So you could just watch the QT and measure the, and not actually go inside the room and prevent exposure of the nurses and other staff to, uh, to the patient um, uh, by performing a, a regular 12 dd ECG. In terms of arrhythmia, I think uh, a lot has been said about this, uh, but I'm going to say 
therapy where um, when the patient has cardiac manifestations, there's a significant likelihood that there's a, a underlying that there's underlying a COVID positivity, and we're seeing that in, on the units right now. Patients manifesting with the unexplained uh, new onset congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, pericardial effusions, who have had a history of a recent viral illness, and they chose to stay home. So we're going to be seeing more and more of this. Uh, it also has the propensity to make existing CHF. Uh, much more likely to be exacerbated, uh, can also manifest atrial, uh, the recurrence of atrial fibrillation and other atrial tachyarrhythmias, and it can certainly lead to more right, to myocardial infarction. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk much about the cardiac transplant patient, um, and uh, that's, that's pretty much it. So if you have a patient who had a viral illness of some sort, or not even a significant viral illness who presents with uh, the exacerbated CHF or unexplained pericardial effusion or uh, unexplained drop in ejection fraction, you should consider COVID as one of the uh, potential causes of that exacerbation. Okay. All right. I think we've over time, but he has to ask for some questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter in the chat box or unmute yourself. Uh, we will let the presenters know. After the fact, uh, you know, over to Stephen Wallace, and uh, we'll be happy to talk to you guys uh, as well. Thank you. All right, like Dr. Ana just said, please feel free to contact the speakers and the presenters individually via email if you have any other further questions. Thank you so much for joining us today for our noon conference. Yes, we will post the presentation on SharePoint and the uh, YouTube channel as well. Thank you so much.